Charlie? Okay, we're going to resume now with the interview uh, by the uh, Scranton Lackawanna County Taxpayers Committee to uh, for the candidates for mayor for 2014 through 18, uh, 17. Uh, we have with us now, and we'd like to get a little uh, background from, uh, is that right to call you Liz? Yeah, because absolutely. I know you like to have Liz so out you there. Got it. That's right. Liz Randall, uh, who is running for mayor. And uh, are you the first woman to run for mayor in the city screen? No, I'm, I, might, I think I'm the first Democrat. First Female Democrat. Democrat. Woman. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's okay. right. Okay. So let's make give a little background on yourself. Sure. Okay. Well, you know, absolutely. The south side. And that's right. Um, so, I, uh, I grew up in Cleveland, um, came here by way of Binghamton. I was finishing my doctoral work at SUNY Binghamton and had the opportunity to take a full-time position at the University of Scranton in 2001. So I moved here a little, right around 12 years ago, bought a house in Southside and have stayed there ever since. Um, I, my educational background, I got my bachelor's degree from Washington and Lee University in Virginia. Uh, obtained my uh, my master's degree in North Carolina. It was a multidisciplinary master's degree from um, uh, North Carolina State Duke and you know in uh, UNC, and then continued on to uh, my my uh, doctoral program at SUNY Binghamton in philosophy. So um, so that was sort of my what happened between Cleveland and, and Scranton. Many years of education. Um, since I've been uh, here, I've had a really great experience with, I would say, a 360 degree kind of view of the city. Um, I was in higher education for many years at the university, um, was heavily involved in a lot of nonprofits, founded a nonprofit myself, but was also on several boards. Uh, had the opportunity to serve as the chief of staff for Lackawanna County. Uh, in that position, I oversaw. Uh, 60 departments helped to do the budget hearings for a almost 90 million dollar budget did the contract negotiations and managed the, the staff effectively um, and uh, Then it was recruited to work in Harrisburg as the policy director for Treasurer McCord So I did that for several years and recently had the opportunity to work in the private sector So I think I have a, um, a good like I said 360 degree view of the of the community here. How old are you too? What's that? How old are you, 82? I'm 82, that's right. I'm 42, I'm 42. I'm very good. That's right. Now, uh, I just want to interrupt this. I want to interrupt a second uh, because uh, I'd be remiss if we didn't tell you that Bill Corbett is not attending tonight. Uh, his campaign manager, attorney Mark Walsh, just passed away a few moments ago. So let's have a moment just of a reflection on that. Thank you. Okay, ladies, what we're going to do is just start off with asking some questions, or I have to ask the questions, and then maybe you can open to the first of the committee, okay? Okay. Okay, if elected, what is your financial plan for our city uh, beginning to, uh, in 2014 to ensure Scranton survival and begin the recovery process? Okay, well, that's a, that's a big, that's a tall order. I'm sure we'll get into some more of the details, so I'll at least keep it somewhat brief. But I'll say that there are five things that I would like to focus on in general as far as where I see the city moving forward and what we need to do to address some of the financial and other concerns. The first, uh, the first thing that I would implement would be zero-based budgeting in all of the departments in the city. It can be a painful and time-consuming sometimes process, but I think that it's definitely important to make sure that every expense is justified that we know where, where our expenses are going, um, and that everybody starts, as it says, zero-based budgeting. You zero everything out, and every expense that you pay has to be justified line item by line item. Following from that, uh, I think it's also important that we make sure that we collect as much data and cross-tab uh, all the information that we have at our disposal within the city to make sure that we have a very good inventory and a solid inventory of what, um, what our housing stock is, um, whether we get that in, in our business stock, whether it's through combining databases for the mercantile tax, the property tax, the garbage collection fees, the sewer, uh, sewer line hookups, et cetera. I think we have a lot of information, but making sure that all of those are uh, pulled together effectively so that we know exactly how many, the rental registration, all of that. So we have the best sense of, of what it is that we have on the books. Um, people have said you can't get blood from a stone. Uh, and I think that that is certainly true, but I do think that there are a lot of opportunities for us to make sure that those people who are not paying their fair share 
are indeed paying their fair share. Uh, and so I think that making sure that we are aggressive in trying to collect um, on all of the, whether, again, garbage collection fees, your, um, uh, your sewer bills, your property tax, your mercantile and business privilege, rental registration, that all of those, if we have a good database, we're going to be able to be more aggressive about collecting uh, revenue that's still left on the table. Uh, I think out fourth, then I would say, would be uh, that it will be incredibly important then to generate new revenue. And the, the two things, this is sort of the, my points two and three of my platform, aside from the financial, would be focusing on uh, reclaiming our neighborhoods and um, rebuilding our industry and economy here in the city. And I'll say specifically about the neighborhoods, I think we can be a lot more strategic about how we deploy and uh, develop strategic plans around our community development block grant funding to make sure that there are community projects that are targeted, and this is not to the exclusion of other projects, but I think we can be more effective and efficient if we highlight a couple of good, worthwhile projects to deploy those, those resources uh, in a, um, a more timely and perhaps bulky fashion at the beginning of the project. And then also to, um, to work on the blight Related issues, um, absentee landlords, the state legislature has recently passed a piece of legislation in 2012 that makes it not just easier to deal with bladed properties, but also to be able to enable cities and municipalities to get those properties back on, to reclaim them and get them back on the tax rolls. Um, economic development, I think it's important, I talked a little bit about this when I was running for commissioner, but the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania identifies and, and ranks each of the counties in the Commonwealth according to what they refer to as targeted industry clusters. It's a bit of a, a wonky term that economic development experts use, but the idea, I think, is a, is a, is a good and compelling one. Namely, what they do is say, okay, in each county, where, what kinds of industries do you currently have there, and in what sectors do you rank in such a way that it puts you above average as far as how many um, types of uh, jobs and opportunities in each sector do you have? Who, who, what counties have the highest number of those opportunities? Um, Scranton, or I'm sorry, Lackawanna County ranks first in both biomedical and healthcare. That's just one area where we excel. The idea behind that being is that we can be, again, more strategic about how we um, recruit new businesses to the community. Uh, and how we work together with both um, chambers, with the Chamber of Commerce, Penns Northeast, et cetera, to make sure that we um, are, are being a bit more uh, intentional about how we're doing our recruiting. And then fifth, I'll say, we have a lot of structural problems in the city that I think are really going to require some significant state intervention. There's some um, really, I think, interesting pieces of legislation that are being circulated around um, Harrisburg and, and other uh, levels of government that I think we need to look at, but I think working in collaboration with our legislators to make sure that we focus on that is, is going to be of utmost importance as well. Very good. She has said a word there that I haven't heard in a long time. Platform. <laughs> <laughs> I have yet, yet to see anybody come out with platforms. You know, and that's you know, actually you're the first that I ever saw it with a platform. Oh, really? okay. <laughs> well, that's. Uh, and I, I'm not trying to watch that, but, but it, it just struck me funny because you know that's what usually a candidate will run on a platform and have a, have a, you know, be able to articulate that platform how they're going to implement it and whatnot. You know, it's good. I'll probably watch that and probably say, "Oh, look at you, were favoring." <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Now. Liz, will you pursue nonprofits for pilots? That's, you know, that payment of lower taxes, uh, as has been accomplished successfully in other municipalities in the state and in other states. Uh, if so, I'll provide your specific plan and how you would do that. Well, I think, um, certainly, I think it is. It's imperative that the nonprofits that we have in this area understand what it means to be in a position where they are sitting on some very uh, lucrative pieces of property in the city, and that it continues to stress county, or I'm sorry, city government, um, in, by moving those properties off of the tax rolls. Um, I will absolutely, uh, I will absolutely work with those nonprofits to see what it is that we might be able to get in return for that. I know the University of Scranton. Um, for many years has contributed. I think that there are lots of other opportunities to seek some relief in that regard. What I will say is that there, I, I, now I'm referring back to some of the, the legislative initiatives, that you know it, it's really only within our ability to negotiate and 
uh, to get along with some of the nonprofits in order to, to try to, re to reach a better agreement as far as wh where those payments are coming from and to what extent they're contributing. Because of course under the federal tax exemption law, they're allowed to, they are tax exempt. So it's not just that they're nonprofits, they are federally tax exempt. That said, there is some movement in the legislature that is trying to look at the types of properties that nonprofits or tax exempt entities are sitting on that if pieces, parts of those properties are not part and parcel mm -hmm. of what their mission is that got them the tax exempt status. That although they might enjoy say 80% of their, the current properties that they're sitting on, that those would remain tax exempt. There very well may be opportunities to carve out um, some of those properties and put those back on the tax rolls because the function of some of those properties are not necessarily in line with what the uh, with what the application was for, to give them the tax exempt status. Good. A potential sale of the Scranton Sewer Authority has been reported in the media, and the Sewer Authority itself issues a RFP request for a proposal for an appraiser or valuation of its assets a few months ago. Do you support this sale? Why or why not? Well, I think it's, it's um, the sale of any asset is an incredibly, I mean, that is a serious decision. I know that the city has sold assets before. Um, I don't know that those have always been the most successful endeavors. I will say that um, in general, as a general rule, I am not in favor of selling public assets. Uh, and I think that certainly something that is held in the common good, such as sewer and wastewater, is, uh, is something that is, um, is a collectively held good. Um, I think, however, it is, even at the very least, looking at the valuation process, which does not necessarily indicate a sale, um, is, however, a good thing for any authority or any government entity to make sure that you understand how much the value of, of that asset is. Um, it will certainly help with, uh, with things like insurance and audits, et cetera, so that we have a very clear understanding um, of how much that asset is. If, if, it, um, if, there is a, if there's movement toward a, a, a sale, that is absolutely not a, um, a, that has not even remotely been determined yet, so. Okay, fine. Uh, in regards to revenue generations, uh, what's your thoughts on raising property taxes, wage taxes, business tax? and the garbage fee in order to balance the budget and meet the city's hefty financial obligations. As you know, every year there's a hole in the budget. That's right. Do you realize that? Do you realize oh, that? Yep. <laughs> I know. I would hope I realize that. <laughs> um, it, you know, look, I, I think at this juncture in this, where the city is, nothing is going to be off the table. Uh, no one wants to hear that. I think anybody that would come in and say that you're going to be able to keep everything stable and the same, certainly there's not going to be an opportunity to reduce taxes. Um, but I will say that, um, I'll say two things. The first is that as I've been looking through the budget and where the revenues go to, it's been an educational experience realizing how our tax, well, we've all just, April 15th has come and gone. And so for most of us, when we're looking at our tax bill, look at how the proportion of what we owe, the, whole, the, the bottom line number, where that goes to. Over, you know, well over half of everybody's bill goes to the Scranton School District, um, then it goes to the county, and then it's to the city. So the city taxes are the smallest portion of those overall taxes. I think in a mistaken fashion, a lot of people also assume that the, uh, the wage tax in the city, the 3.4%, is entirely levied by the city. 1% of that goes to the school district. In addition, the mercantile and business privilege tax is also shared in a very, uh, very significant way with the school district. So um, my argument, if I'm elected, um, is that, you know, I think pe no one likes to pay taxes. Uh, certainly no one likes to pay increased taxes, but I do think that if people know what it is that you get for that, that investment, for that, those dollars, 100% of the people that live in the city enjoy the benefits and the services that the city of Scranton provides. Um, that may not be the case for the school district or for the county. My job, if I'm elected, is to make the best case argument for, for the amount of services and the number of services that the people in the city utilize for the price that they get. Um, I think certainly, you know, part of my plan, of course, with the zero-based budgeting, making sure that we get good data collection, and then also making sure that we get additional revenue is precisely to make sure that if and when there are additional tax increases, that it is reduced and mitigated as much as possible because we have been able 
um, at the very least to get a good sense and a handle on where we are financially and to make sure that everybody is contributing their fair share. Good. Uh, you know, in all due respect to the council here, they've had a situation for the last 10 years where the, the mayor and the city council never the two show me, okay? Uh, so what are your thoughts in regards to uh, meeting regularly with the uh, city council and your staff, your, your administration in regards to, you know, Absolutely. Issues? No, I think, honestly, I think people at this juncture, they're tired and exhausted from, from the bickering and the arguing. I think that at some point that just, you get stuck in a qu quagmire and it makes it very difficult to govern and it makes it even more difficult to make a good argument because people aren't listening anymore because they're just, all they're hearing is the din. Um, I do think that that's part of the reason why my candidacy and certainly the fact that I'm not from here can be a good way to perhaps move the needle a little bit, if you will, on how uh, we engage. I don't have some of the same sort of, uh, um, you know, generational feuding. I don't have the same access to grind. Those are not my fights. This is a city that I've fallen in love with and been here for 12 years and I'm dedicated and committed to staying here. That said, um, I think it would be of utmost importance to make sure that at least on a quarterly basis that there would be a formal, whether it's an address, a meeting with council in, you know, publicly, you know, in chambers here, um, and that when and if it's, it's necessary and required, I don't see any problem in the world with making sure that there's an open door policy with council to meet with p members of um, my administration if I'm elected, um, and to make sure that that conversation continues, you know, both inside um, council chambers and outside. Good. Uh, well, you're familiar with master plans, comprehensive plans. The city has a master plan which has upstairs collecting dust and uh, they never actually follow the master plan. As a lot of municipalities, they'll gear their capital improvements, their social and economic uh, progress on what the master plan is, okay? But the city has never done that. They just roll the dice into the CDBG funds Whoever shouts the loudest or whoever is on the third rail, okay, gets the funds. And the same with the, the, uh, with the, with the capital improvements program. They, they, the, I've never seen them go to uh, the planning and say, what is the capital, what is proposed in the master plan? Of course, the master plan now is defunct because it's been up there for so many years. What's your thoughts on a master plan? I would say I, I'm, uh, my entire life, my professional background has been a good combination, I think, of um, a lot of education, a lot of nerdy kind of stuff. I really like plans. I like strategic planning. It's what I've even done professionally. Uh, and so I do very much enjoy making sure that there is some, that we've, we put some bumper rails on what it is that we're doing so that we know that if we are proceeding in a certain way that there are some benchmarks that we can hit, we make sure that we know which resources are designated for what purpose. Uh, but I also think that part of, you know, even though I've spent many years in, uh, in school, uh, which I very much, of course, enjoyed, the, the other flip side is that I am a very transactional and practical person. I like to make sure that we don't have, sometimes I think plans, if they are too bulky mm -hmm. and um, too difficult to weed through, they, it makes it difficult to, make, to, to implement them. So I think up, whether it's updating the existing master plan, looking at that, reviewing it, um, but also making a, creating a document that is a practical one that really serves as a way to communicate not just to the public but also to your staff and administration. This is where we're headed. These are the benchmarks we want to hit, and that you it doesn't turn into a you know 400 page tome that people have to thumb through all the time. But that there's some very there's some good data, some good plans, and certainly a a, um, a, a very specific plan for implementation. Yeah. For instance, neighborhood blight. Mm -hmm. Actually. Uh, if you look at a master plan, and that's the plan the city of Scotland, I'm aware of it, there's areas for housing rehabilitation and new construction under the vacant lots that's in the city and stuff. And that stuff has never been followed through with, you know, and that was what I'm trying to say. No, and I agree with you, and that's why I just, I go back to part of my, part of my platform on the neighborhoods. And I do think that there, there is a lot of money at our disposal uh, through, uh, whether it's HUD, uh, whether it's through um, the community development block grant funding. There's a lot of opportunities. These are not things that cost us any money, but they continue to improve our neighborhoods because quite honestly, 
um, you know, the reason what everything that we're doing to make sure that the city doesn't fall off a cliff is to protect people's number one investment, and that is their homes. It is the one thing that most of us, those of us who own homes, know it is the biggest investment we'll ever make. And if we don't protect that and make sure that th those values do not plummet, uh, then then we're really going to be in serious trouble. Good. Uh, do you mind if you open the floor for Abs uh, uh, absolutely? The bill, you have a question. Uh, yeah, Liz, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked the other two candidates, and that is, if you were elected mayor, will you be willing to reduce salaries of city employees, even if it means renegotiating contracts? I know you cannot just reduce them. That's correct. It has to, you, you're going to have to re redo contracts with the union employees. Uh, right now, we, our payroll, our biweekly payroll every two weeks is $1.3 million. Uh, that's not affordable or sustainable in my mind. I agree. Okay, uh, so would you be willing to sit down and negotiate with the city employees and the unions and see if we can get the sal that salary reduced because uh, we can't afford 1.3 million every yeah. two weeks? Well, I'll say this, Bill. I'll, um, I'll extend that a little bit further. I think that. Um, what is of concern is as we're approaching the um, after the court the recent court awards um, we're looking at approximately 80 upwards of 85 percent of the city's entire city's budget is salaries and benefits All right now it's at 75 percent yeah so I mean we're, we're looking at a serious um, serious increase and um, and that itself I would absolutely agree with you it's not sustainable I don't know how you run a, a city on the remaining you know 15 percent of that so uh, that said, I think salaries are, are very important. What I found when I was working at the county when we were doing contract negotiations is that one of the most significant, the two things that actually were the biggest drivers of the expense were, is health care and the pensions. Um, health care in particular because there's no way to really budget very well for it because you can't control the percentage increase that you get from the where however you structure your health care so I think that those three things in combination are gonna, will need to be looked at um, as a as a collective whole because um, even if we were to if we were able to to um, to address some of the pension issues moving forward there are again issues even in, currently in the state legislature that's looking at trying to make this would not be something that would be for existing employees but moving pension plans into 401k type what they would be defined contribution as opposed to defined benefit plans um, that that makes it far far easier and a bit more manageable for municipalities and certainly for the state as they're looking at it um, and um, yeah and I think and also obviously looking at the, the health care the, the, the benefits are Right. contributions there and, and certainly the plan right now we're, we're looking at about 2700 people on health care and retirees and that's not affordable or sustainable either in my opinion uh, my second question is if you were not successful in renegotiating the contracts would you be willing if you had to to introduce a hundred percent property tax increase to to keep the city afloat uh, are you referring to what is sort of outlined in the recovery plan and right mm -hmm. if, if need be you know because the, the bills are going to keep coming in and the so, only way if we can't generate revenue if things stay copacetic the way they are now right and you had to increase taxes by 100 percent could you do it well or look, would I mean, you do it well i mean that's a that that's a that's a big question i would certainly hope that we are not in that position what i will say however is that one of the things that i will absolutely not do is to seek bankruptcy chapter 9 filing I think it would be the most catastrophic thing that we could do uh, for this city for a couple of reasons and as, as I've been talking with people often people will say oh, why don't we just file bankruptcy but I ask them what is it about bankruptcy that you think will work and and I, I find that there's there are two commonly uh, m there are two common misunderstandings about it First is that it's not it does not wipe away you all probably know this better than, than the average person in the public but um, what it does not do is it does not wipe away your debt the city is still on the hook it is not like corporate or personal bankruptcy um, it does prevent the vendors from from ceasing their services uh, to the city if it can't pay its bills but at the same time it doesn't clear it just doesn't clear away the debt um, and that's under the federal chapter 9 filing uh, there are but on a state-by-state -state basis what in Pennsylvania it also does not do and there's no real clear legal precedent it also does not afford cities to break union contracts Michigan 
as we're looking at what's happening with Detroit or even in Stockton, California, um, those states, and particularly in Michigan, does allow for very aggressive um, you know, reopenings of contracts, wholesale um, elimination of them starting from scratch. Pennsylvania law does not explicitly enable that in its legislation, and therefore there is no legal precedent to do it. Um, and finally, on top of it, I could say I wanted to file for bankruptcy. You still have to get the approval of the state and the courts. And that is, we've seen how difficult that is with Harrisburg, um, who was in very serious trouble. And if you want to talk about having an issue with nonprofits and the things being off the tax rolls, that city is absolutely, it is from top to bottom, side to side, up and down, filled with government buildings. They're almost their entire city is, is comprised of properties that are tax exempt. And so I think it is, it's a tall order, and I think it would be devastating financially for the city. And so I certainly hope that I would, we would never be in a position to be raising and increasing taxes by 100%. The fact of the matter is the reason why the courts don't approve bankruptcies is that, you know, you can actually pay your bills, you just have to bite the bullet and do it. I think it is something that will drive people out of the city. I think it will cause people to have to foreclose. It would be the last thing that I would want to do, and I think that that's why focusing on the previous parts of my plan hopefully will get us to a place where um, we are a bit more strategic about what we're doing. We have, um, that we're collecting the kinds of revenue that is still on the table and that we prevent that at all costs. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? And anybody else have a question? Dave? Uh, okay. Uh, most of the other candidates uh, would basically be in agreement on sale of assets. Uh, um, you're definitely a, or tentatively against selling anything like the sewer authority or, or what have you. Uh, I, it's been a failure in the past and and uh, we, I don't think it's, you're throwing it in the hands of a corporation, you're just going to stack, stack a profit margin on top of the sewer bill, which already has to be paid. Right. And there is a, a huge obligation for the sewer authority at this point with some of the, um, the federally mandated upgrades. So um, there, there's a lot of work that is still left to do there. Um, like I said, though, I mean, these are, these are questions that I think honestly, to be the most responsible person in this position, to get back to your point, Bill, about, you know, the incre you know, looking at a 100% tax increase, I think that it would be a little bit reckless, however, to completely and totally, just to fail to look at every available option. I don't think it very well may be that it is, that the sale of that asset is not going to get us the kind of revenue that we need, that it would absolutely, that it would not work in the ways that you, that we know sometimes has not worked and that certainly would, um, would put the city in a, in a worse position. I think all of those, those are enormous questions that have not even, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of those questions. So I think I would be remiss in saying that I like, would refuse to look at anything, but at the same time, I think that, um, that I, I, th I think that, you know, one-time sale of assets is certainly, as you know, is not, the, is no way to be crafting a budget. And would you, uh, would you be interested uh, in increasing fees as opposed to taxes and potentially uh, charging <coughs> nonprofits fees uh, uh, as, a, as an alternative to taxes or begging? Well, I mean, I think <coughs> we have to sort, we would have to see what, uh -huh. what that looks like. I mean, I, one of the things that, what I, what I like to, to try to do when I'm thinking about this picture, because it is so, it is, we're in such a severe um, environment right now mm -hmm. that, you know, the thing, the fact of the matter is if you're looking, whether it's at hospitals, educational institutions, they bring a tremendous amount of resources to the community, um, whether it's investment, um, whether it's the students that are here, the knowledge base that helps us invite and include, like the Commonwealth Medical College. You know, we are in a position to be able to include and invite other kinds of industries that are for profit and are tax paying um, because we have that knowledge base in the area. What I don't want to have happen is that as we are drowning, that we are trying to grab onto and, and whack all of the, 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 all of the institutions and some of them that are doing very well. Those are the things that are enabling us on some level to anchor um, parts of our community. But I do think that the bigger question is, and I know I keep going back to some of this stuff in the legislature, but I think that these are tremendously helpful or at least important conversations. There's, some, there's a piece of legislation currently being floated that is proposing to reduce the school property tax 
and replace it with an increase in the um, in the income tax and a 1% increase in the state sales tax. The idea behind it being that I think um, the reason why I think you all are here, why, why most of us are here, and why these questions are as difficult as they are, um, is that it takes a lot of political will um, to make some of these difficult decisions. The reason being is that the, the almost the exclusive burden um, for the tax revenue uh, is is born on the property owners, um, and so if you make the if you make it a bit more equitable aqu across the board as to in terms of who is is paying and who is responsible for that revenue, the idea with the school property tax is that the elimination of that is that it would get funded directly from the state. You um, you increase the the income tax a little bit and the sales tax, which is you know those are not on the the types of goods and services. Um, it might be on entertainment. Um, I don't know about alcohol necessarily, but in any case, you end up saying, okay, well, it's not always, then you pick up people who are renting, people who are traveling into Pennsylvania, into our communities, and they also have to share in the burden. Um, and so I think that those are, you know, as we're looking at increasing fees to not just cherry pick, I think, again, these are structural problems that if we solve and try to look at and negotiate bigger picture ways as we move forward, we don't have to then get into some of the Okay, how do we like? How do we take care of this issue? How do we make sure that the nonprofits are contributing in the way that we would like them to? How do we make sure that um, you know, if we want a commuter tax, I mean, it's all these different things that we're trying to cobble together. If we have measurable, sustainable, and structural change, we a lot of these things I think could be um, could be addressed wholesale. Thank you. I think. Uh, Can I ask one more? Sure. I guess so. Uh, Liz, what are your thoughts and ideas to get Scranton out of the distressed city status? We've been in the status now roughly 250 months. That's a long time. It is a long time. And uh, if you're elected, will you work diligently and hard in your first four years to try to get us out of the distressed city? Because it's an embarrassment to live in a city that's distressed. Well, look, I think it's, um, it's certainly one of those things we do not want to be on that list anymore. I would absolutely, I would, you shouldn't vote for me if I would say I wouldn't work diligently to get us off distressed city status. I mean, that is a, that is a clear goal. If we're able to balance our budget, um, then we might be looking at getting off the distressed status. But I will say um, what is also uh, an embarrassment is the length of time that we have gone without a county-wide property tax reassessment. Um, it was one of the things that I ran on when I um, when I ran for commissioner. And the thing is, is that you know you have in the in the county in general, and most people don't like talking about reassessment. The problem is, is that um, you know most. Well, I should say the problem with property tax reassessment: one third of the values that people are paying go down, a third stay the same, and a third go up. Um, I, I've almost yet to meet anyone that does not live on a block where they have not looked up all of the surrounding, their neighbors, right? You've all done it, right? Everybody's done it. And you can see the wild disparity between those. Um, there have been some calculations that this is, an, again, I'll, this is admittedly ballpark number, but that if there were a proper, a countywide reassessment, that without touching our current tax structure where they currently sit, we might be looking at a $13 million influx in additional revenue just because we have been diligent and, um, and uh, thorough about looking at a, at a countywide reassessment. To me, and I'm not saying that the distressed status is not something that we should be embarrassed about, but everyone you know, will say, oh, Scranton's 20 years behind the times, 10 years behind the times. We're 40 years behind the times in our reassessment, and that is a true embarrassment and an impediment to economic growth and development. Amen. I think that uh, we had the opportunity to speak to Liz for a little longer than we talked about, but we appreciate that very much. Thank you all very much for having me. Uh, thank you, Liz, and best of luck to you, and thank you for coming in. Absolutely. Thanks for the invitation, I think. I do want to say that uh, Mr. Courtright, Bill Courtright, will probably be uh, with the Republican uh, candidates when they come in to be get uh, interviewed uh, because of the death of uh, his campaign manager, Attorney Walsh. Uh, if that be it, can we adjourn for the evening? Second. So adjourn. Thank you for everybody.